Great, everyone. Well, if we can take 2 Corinthians 4, and I've given you a handout. I wonder if you can find it. You had it at the start of the day, beautifully put together uh, by the committee here. So if you could reach for that handout, because we will be working from it. So what does it look like to partner with Christ in sharing this hope? And just as we uh, kick off, just a couple of thoughts on this morning. The first is, you, you, you say, look, Rick, I, you know, brother, I do believe that stuff about hell. I don't know how I start a conversation on it without it being terribly difficult. I'll tell you what I do. I, so in my bag, as you know, I always carry out my X Out Loud book, um, just to saying, can we be a safe place for these dear brothers and sisters? Will you let that happen? The other thing I always carry in my bag, I, I, I carry a, 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 a cigarette packet. And uh, actually, I just want to say, Dano, thanks for lending me this. I'd lost mine, so I just appreciate that, bro, very much. But, um, and I, I get this out, and I, I say to people, I say, look, mate, it's quite difficult to say this because the, the friendship's important with you. So what I say now could be difficult. So I always, before I say something, I, I establish the friendship's important because I know I'm crossing a pain line and risking a, fr a friendship. And then I get out my cigarette packet, and I say, if, if I was here smoking in front of you, I think if you were a friend of mine, knowing the danger that there is in smoking, you might say, Rico, are you sure about that? I mean, you're a fat old boy anyway, but you know, are you sure about, about this? I think if you were a good friend, you'd say, look, just a lot of people die from, and, look what, and, and you'd say, look, look at the warning on the packet. And I, I then say to them, I say, look, just as there's a warning here, I, I want to tell you there's a warning in the Bible about whether you know the God who's made you and whether you've been forgiven. And I, I just... I'm not your friend if I don't point it out. So I, I, I want to advocate that all of you leave here and go and buy some cigarettes and keep them on you and, and just use that. So I use that just to bridge into, just to cross the pain line on that. Because as a good mate, you would mention the smoking. And Dano, I want to say you must stop, brother. I just, I am worried about that. But I mean, but, but what, I'm, what I'm saying is that, is that, is that uh, that's how I get to hell with people. That's how I try and do that. I say, look, there's a warning here. It's a red-hot warning. You've just got to decide whether it's reality or not. But I'm not your mate if I haven't passed this on to you. Uh, many years ago, when I was getting my third at Oxford, when I said to my tutor, was I close to a 2-2? Uh, he said, no, Rico, it was a very solid third. So I knew then that ordination to the Church of England was the only career option available. And, um, <laughs> but I, I, um, I played rugby with the university, and I, I, one time I gave a sermon I, I'd preached John 1, verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I gave it on, it was a tape in those days, to Ed. And, uh, 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 and Ed lived in a rugby house with, with Dave and Ben and Chris, all non-Christians. But the night before a game, a quiet night in, they were sort of pastor loading, um, they, they played it. And in that sermon I said, either we pay for our sin, or John 1, 29, the Lamb pays. And as the sermon was being played, Dave, who was the captain of the Blues team, got more and more cross. And at the end of it, he said, Rico's not my friend. And they said, don't be ridiculous. Of course he's your friend. You play in the front row together. You play golf together. You room on tour. He said, <coughs> half an hour ago, I thought he was one of my best friends. The fact he said nothing to me in 18 months means he doesn't care for me. If that's what he believes, because he's not spoken to me, he doesn't care for me. And then the non-Christian I'd given the tape to, Ed, rang up and said, look, I'm, mate, I'm sorry, I played the tape to Dave He's upset you've not spoken to him. I think you need to speak to him. Now, that changed my understanding of evangelism, that phone call. Because this bloke said, he was a, you know, he was a, first he was a captain, he was a leader. He said, if you care, you give me the information. Now, we're not giving people the information, brothers. So we have this view, um, you know, uh, my faith is a personal, private thing, and it helps me in my life. I wouldn't dream of imposing it on other people. But, I mean, you know... <sighs> where will they be? So do jot this down at the start. Where will they be in 100 years' time? That's the question. Or less than that with where we're at at the moment with Ukraine. Where will they be? So that's my, 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 my first point. And then secondly, if I'm not speaking to people, I found that in Honest Evangelism, the, the two bits of feedback I got from this book, the one was the pain line. We all have to cross it. I'm saying here's a way of crossing it. The second thing I got was chapter three in this book about idols. So after 20 years at my church, I said, the reason people aren't speaking about Jesus is there is an idol, which is a good thing that's become a God thing. 
there's something that's more important to them than, I mean, as we just heard, the verdict has been given and, and you've won. And you don't have to do any. Jesus has done the performing. That's the verdict. It's a declaration of righteousness. But there's something that's got in ahead of that. And that's why we're not speaking. So just as, if you just want to jot this down, why am I not speaking about Jesus to friends? Why am I not doing it? And I might ask you two questions the Puritans would ask. Do you jot these down to go away with? What are my daydreams and what are my nightmares? What are my daydreams and what are my nightmares? And if my daydream isn't, I can't believe it. I have been given this verdict of righteous. When, there's, when I'm simulius to peccato, at the same time justified in the sinner, I see so much depravity, and yet I'm declared. If that ain't, guys, if that isn't the daydream, uh, you know, uh, uh, so can I just pass that on? If I'm not speaking, just it, often the idols will unpick what gets me moving on that. Great, let's turn to 2 Corinthians 4 as we've got it in front of us here, everyone, the passage here. And I wonder again, by the way, evangelism uh, training, this is training, not lecturing. Lecturing as I just speak, training as we go back and forth. Let's go back with this question. So 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6, here is Paul defending his ministry. And here's the question, please write it down and think of the two guys. Do you remember in your head you've got to have, uh, you're you're doing this for. Um, But here's the question, jot it down and then let's do it in pairs, the person next to us. Who is at work in the work of evangelism? So have a look at this passage. Um, I think the most important, John Chapman taught me, the most important passage on evangelism in the Bible. I think that's true, these six verses. Gosh, we've got to look to them now post-COVID. But just in pairs, can we answer that question now? So lean across the person and say, so who's at work in the work of evangelism? It may be that you don't like doing it in pairs, in which case just say, I don't like people, I'm doing it on my own. That's fine, and then we'll go from there. Okay, off we go. In Paris, let's have a go. One more minute, one more minute. Who's at work in the work of evangelism? Great, what have we got there? So remember, some of you will know this so well, but think about the two people you're you're training Think about how you teach it to them. That changes the listening because you're a river, not a reservoir. Let's always be doing that. Um, Off we go. Someone shout out. Who's at work? What have we got here? Who does what from these verses? Anyone give me a verse and and, and what's to be done by whom? Yep. God shows us mercy and we've got this ministry because of his mercy. Yep, that's what, 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 so there's a ministry. Now, what's the ministry? We're, we're told there's a ministry. Which verse outlines the ministry? Which verse tells me what the ministry is? Si- ver- verse six tells me what God's ministry is. Do we see verse six? Now, jot this down, everyone. You have got to teach this to others and get it, your, get it for yourself. Uh, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness. And what I always ask there is, where is that? Where does it say, let light shine out of darkness? Where is it in the Bible? Genesis 1, so jot it down. So the God who in Genesis 1 said, let there be light, this is what God does, made his light shine in our hearts. So he took the power that made the world 
and he shone his light into our hearts. He didn't create us, he recreated us and jot this down and got us to see the glory of God in the face of Christ. In other words, he got us to see, jot it down, that Jesus is God. So, so conversion, now here's the big word, is a miracle. And it's a miracle in which God shines his light into my heart and gets me to see that Jesus isn't a swear word or a figure of history or a great moral teacher. He's God. And if you believe that, it's because God's done a a miracle in you. So, you know, when you meet someone and and their their testimony is, you know, they say, say, why are you Christian? You say, oh, well, I just came from a lovely Ulster Christian home, had a lovely Christian mum, that's why I'm Christian. Do you know what you have to do? Very gently, don't do it inside. Take them outside, put your arms around them, and headbutt them. The reason you're Christian is because God did a miracle. I've got relations in my family. I can think of one. Stone-cold atheist. I mean, I can't think of another way of trying to tell them. We need a miracle. Isn't it true for you, people you know? It's a miracle we need, and that's why you're sitting here. In God's grace, the reason you're here is God did a miracle. Maybe when you were a little one and opened your blind eyes because you were, Ephesians 2 verse 1, dead in transgressions and sins. So what does God do? He opens blind eyes. That's what he does. What else have we got here? That's what God does. Who else does what? Let's have some more as we look down. Yeah, we're to set it. Which verse tells me how to set it forth? What is the job description of evangelism here? Someone give me a verse. We are to set that. What's the truth we're to set forth plainly? Which verse encapsulates it? Verse 5. Do you see what it says, verse 5? We don't preach ourselves, but Jesus as Lord. So we preach Christ. I wonder if we can stick that up on the screen. So here we are. This is the job description of evangelism. We preach Christ, and God opens. So so here's the power. We preach Christ, God opens blind eyes. Please write it down. That's what it's about. My job is to speak of Jesus, and by the way, We preach of Jesus as Lord. So uh, the problem I've got with the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, is that because he won't ask people to repent of same-sex relationships, he speaks of Jesus a lot, but not as Lord. So that his Jesus is different from my Jesus. The Jesus I speak of says, you've got to repent of all sin, including sexual sin. What we do with our hands and feet matters to God. But Justin Welby says, no, there are areas you don't have to repent. And the Church of England, my church, is going to break up over the next 10 years over that word, repentance. We will break up over that word. But you see, what's interesting is we'll keep preaching Jesus as Lord. We won't lose our nerves because God is the one who opens blind eyes. So I'll keep saying it. However controversial to the culture is, I'll keep saying, by the way, here are are 40 people whose lives have been transformed and they want a safe place now. So, so the gospel does its work. We preach Christ, God opens blind eyes. And we preach Jesus as Lord. Right, as we look back down, we, we've had a bit of it. How do we, so here's the next question in pairs. Can we do this again? So take this away and, and open this with people. But here's the second question. Number one was, who's at work in the work of evangelism? The second is this, how do we preach Christ? Back over to you, just in pairs. There are at least four applications on how to preach Christ. Let's see if we can dig them out for a minute. How do we preach Christ? There are at least four things said here on how to do it. Again, I'm taking this passage away and going to be using it back home with others. Off you go. How do we preach Christ? Okay, brothers, got to keep you moving. 
Someone shout out. What, what, are, what are we told about how we're to do this? How are we to preach Christ if these verses are so? Yeah, we've got to do it plainly. And the two areas we've got to do it plainly are wrath and repentance, certainly in the Church of England in, in England. So two R's, wrath and repentance. Drop them down, please. So, so wrath, God's settled, controlled hostility to evil. And by the way, float that. It's a very good thing God judges because it means how I treat you, how you treat me, and how we treat the world matters to God. God cares about every person who's been killed in Ukraine in the last 48 hours. Every person, and there'll be a judgment for that. Isn't it a great thing there's a judgment to come? So first of all, wrath, it's a good thing. But also, what about my sin? Secondly, repentance. Do jot down, this is the definition of repentance. What Jesus is for, I'm for. What he's against, I'm against. So again, the reason these people say they can trust Christ is they say, I look at Jesus, I trust him. He died for me. He'll keep me safe. I'm following him. So, so wrath and repentance. We set forth it plainly. Now, what's interesting is what's happened to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Can we have a look down? You see, we're, we're meant not to lose heart. Because he's lost heart in, in terms of evangelism, what he's done is that he stopped preaching wrath and repentance. That's what the liberals do. What the liberals do is they go, oh, the culture won't accept it. We can't say it. They forget verse 6, which we've just got to be faithful and God will open blind eyes. And that's what's happening amongst the gay community as people are coming to faith. So you keep teaching Christ. God will, God will open blind eyes. But if you lose heart, then what you do is distort the word of God. And let's always remember on evangelism, I'm an evangelist. But do jot this down. Evangelism is always a subset of faithfulness. And so often the reason we get lost is that we make faithfulness a subset of evangelism. We say, oh, we can't mention the gay thing because people won't like it. Week one of Christianity Explored or Hope Explored, I mention it and I say, by the way, we trust Christ to know what's best. Here are people's lives who found it. If you want to keep coming, you just need to know we're going to be saying that. I trust Christ to, to, to do that. Make sure the tone's right. What else have we got here as we look down? How else are we to do it as we preach Christ? Verse 6, can you see, if God is the one who opens blind eyes, whose department is the results department? It's God's, isn't it? God's department. So the results belong to God. At the end of a mission, though, as I'm, I'm an insecure evangelist, what do I always get asked at the end of every mission? What's the one question they always ask me? How many? What should they ask me in verse 5? What's the question I should be asked? Did you preach Christ? But if you ask me how many, because I'm insecure, I'll say 740. It was amazing. And then they'll give me more money. Do you know what? I mean, I, I, I was doing some Christian Explored fundraising in the States. And by the way, Ulster's been amazing on that. The Baird family funding CE, just fantastic. But, but, but do you know, just, just I mean, I, I was there. The, the organization I followed had said to the people in charge, for every $80 you give us, we'll give you a convert. They literally said it. And I was like, so we then uh, didn't get any money. We had a row about this verse. Didn't go very well, that fundraising trip. But I'm just saying that, you know, <laughs> that they're up to God. But my job is to be faithful. But only he can switch on the lights. What else have we got? Verse 4, do you see the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers? So what does that mean we've got to do? The results belong to God. And amid COVID, I've got to know that. But if, if, God, if, if the devil has blinded eyes, what have we got to do? We've got to pray. Brothers, how's your prayer going? If you see me up after 11 o'clock, it means I've decided not to pray the next day. That's what I've just found in my life. If I'm up after 11, you'll say, oh, Rico, you see you've decided not to pray. I'll be cross with you, but you'll be right. You know, I've got to get to bed. I've got to say my prayers. Brothers, if you've stopped, start again. Lord God, please open my dear, this member of my family, open his blind eyes. Please, Lord, do the miracle in them, these two guys, please. So we pray, and God's the evangelist. Okay, now can we see one other application as we look down? Ourselves, verse 5, as your servants for Jesus' sake. Now let's turn back to 1 Corinthians 9 and see what it means to be a servant. Now this is particularly important during COVID where so much has changed. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19. How am I someone's servant in evangelism? Here is Paul, and he says, I'm a free man, but, but I've, I've, I, what I have done is I have... In my freedom, made myself a slave to all to win as many as possible. So he sacrifices racial identity, religious sensitivity with one goal in mind. Do you see there? 
to win as many as possible. Though I'm free and belong to no one, I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Verse 22, to the weak I become weak to win the weak. I become all things to all people, so by all possible means I might save some. So please look at my hands. Here's what I do in evangelism. My right hand is rock solid on gospel truth and doctrine. I do not give way. Whatever the issue, I don't give way. I know Jesus knows best, and I'm gonna stay faithful. But my left hand, amid COVID, is reaching. So, and this requires, write this word down, please. Here's the word, energy. Energy. So, with God's sovereignty, we need him to open blind eyes. I need to pray. With integrity, I need to tell the truth. But, but creativity here means I've got to keep reaching for people. And amidst the last 18 months, what does it mean to reach for people? Um, let me give you one example. There, there was one person up, up on the North Coast who came on Hope Explored last summer, and uh, he could only come for one evening because the, the nature of the pressures on him. And then we read the Bible together online. We rang each other um, uh, probably 30 times over the last um, uh, six months. I've been ringing um, up this guy in Port Rush, or as he's driven around, sometimes it's been as he's been in his car. And I've only met him once, we played Port Rush. It was more than marvelous to meet him. If you're going to only meet someone once, that's what we did. We had a game of golf. But, but that, I'd never have dreamed of ministry being like that pre-COVID. But that's 30, 30 phone calls of 20, 20 minutes, sometimes five minutes, sometimes 15. But just opening up a passage of the Bible, because my job is to preach Christ, and God will open blind eyes. And he professed faith in, in October. But it was just the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. But online, I've only met him once. But you see, that's what it is. So you see, we pray, we tell the truth, but we've got to reach. What does it mean now to be reaching for people? And if we can go back to our, our, our bits of paper here. Here we are. Let's, let's see those three themes. God's sovereignty, that means God has to open blind eyes. Acts 17, he's the sovereign. Gospel integrity, I've got to tell the truth. I can't be like Archbishop Welby, who won't tell the truth for fear of the culture. I can't, he does believe in Jesus, but he won't speak of Jesus as he is. It's desperate. Pray for him. Thirdly, creativity. I've got, to, I've, got to be, I've got to have energy. I've got to reach for people. And over the page now, brothers, let's turn over the page and see how this works for you personally in your church. I want you to do this exercise. What happens if in my evangelism, and these are the great three gospel themes, okay? These are the three principles of evangelism. So if you look down, what happens... If, I, if I've got God's sovereignty, I know the results belong to him. He has to open blind eyes. I've got creativity. I'm reaching people, but I'm not doing integrity. I'm distorting the word. I'm thinking, oh, I can't say that. They won't like it. I can't speak about service. I can't speak about wrath. What, what's the result? So there are two or three applications. Next one down. What happens if, I'm, if we're praying and we've got gospel integrity, but there's no creativity? So, you know, COVID comes and goes, but we go, you know what? Same as usual. We're just going to keep doing the same thing. It's the same methodology. What happens then? Thirdly, what happens if we've got integrity, we're telling the truth, we've got creativity, but we've not got sovereignty? What happens if we, if we, if we, if, if, you know, we don't realize it's up to God to open blind eyes? I can't tell you how important this is at this point in time for our evangelism to get these three. Over to you. Just, just give me an application of what happens if you... A couple of applications per, per box as we close on what happens if you miss one of those out. Over to you. Great. Have a little look at that. Okay, everyone. Let's go. What happens if... Do you see that, that, that first one at the top? If I've got sovereignty, I'm saying my prayers, the results belong to God, I know it's a miracle, I've got in creativity, there's lots of energy going in, but I'm not doing integrity. What are the results pastorally for those in my care? Say that louder. The wrong gospel. Yeah, yeah, that's not a gospel of Jesus is Lord. What will the non-Christian think as they watch them? They'll go, they're no different. My father um, has died now. He was actually in cigarettes for 40 years, my dad. But uh, when I told him at 21 I wanted to get ordained, he said to me, Rico, I had business colleagues that went from the brothel to mass. He said, uh, I don't know why you're getting involved with these people. They're such hypocrites. They're disgusting people. Why are you getting involved with these Christians? He was a non-Christian, but he didn't go for the brothel for Matt, to, from the brothel to Mass on business trips. We've got to be semper ref, re, reformanda, always repenting. And similar tack from underneath. You know, it's just easy believing otherwise. 
Okay, and also, there'll be no joy because Christian joy comes out of Christian obedience. As we battle to obey and we repent and we go through Romans 8, but Christian joy comes out of trying to be obedient. It doesn't mean we are, but as we do that, we find the Spirit is, it gives us joy. What happens um, if, if, next one, I, I've got to go quick here, but what happens, brothers, if we've got sovereignty and integrity but not creativity? What happens then? So we're doing it the same way as we have for 50 years. What's the result then? Yeah, we're talking to ourselves. People aren't there. So as Ian, Ian Murray said, you know, we're fishing off the White Cliffs of Dover. <laughs> what does it mean to reach people? Now, that's why Christians in Sport is brilliant, because the first thing I always used to get people to when I was a student at uni, I remember, was, was always Christians in Sport. The church then got credit if they got going later on. But the first thing was Christians in Sport. Do you want to come? Yeah, well, I like my sport. I'll come along to a sports quiz. You know, get the lines in the water. I once rang up. I was trying to do a Christians in Sport rugby tour in Northern Ireland, and I rang up somebody who was known, um, well-known as a rugby player, and uh, I said, I'd like to bring a, a, a tour. I said, they're going to be 10 non-Christians, 11 Christians. We're going to come and play rugby, do a week's rugby. I wonder if you'd host us. And his reply to me was, we really don't want to sponsor your little holiday. Do you imagine how, how hard work that is, running one of those tours, trying to teach the Bible each day, play? It was to win those guys. We didn't come. We went to Spain. Because he said to me, Do you, we're not going to sponsor your little holiday. It was like it was some, what? No, we were doing it for evangelism. That's how they could relate to us. It was a tough phone call. I put the phone down really discouraged. We've got to reach out. What does it mean to get involved? So, so God's sovereignty, gospel integrity, but our lines have got to be in the water. What does it mean? to? Otherwise, it's Disney World, and they become targets. We're saying to them, you've got to be like me or you can't come. How do we reach across? And that takes energy and discipline. Thirdly, as we, as we look down, what about the third one as we look down here? What happens if I've got integrity and creativity but not sovereignty? I don't realize it's God's work. What happens then? Burnout. Yeah, that, absolutely, brother. Burnout. You have a breakdown. Because do jot this down. The most stressful thing in the Christian life is leaving good things undone. Is that all right? There are all these good things I can do. I haven't got time to do them. And then another day's gone, and I've, you know, my sinful nature's been such a battle, and, you know, but, you know, this means, I mean, D.L. Moody used to say, Lord, it's your work, I'm going to bed now. <sighs> you know, but if you don't believe that, you'll have a breakdown. So it's God's work, and you see, and, and that means, you know, as an evangelist, if you don't believe that, by the way, if loads of people get, get, get converted, what happens? You're proud. If none get converted, you're discouraged. Can you think of anything worse? A proud middle-class Englishman. It's terrible. So what I'm saying is, you know, it's got to, you've got to get sovereignty in place. Now, of those three, brothers, look down. Which one's your weakness? Is it that you're not believing, that, that you're not praying and knowing that it belongs to God, it's his work? Is it you're not telling the truth? You know, you maybe need to get a cigarette packet and start, start actually, you know, saying, what about that? Or is it, as you look down, creativity? There's just, you're just not doing the energy. What's going to change in COVID? How do I, what do I do? Start going for walks? How do I connect with people? I love Roger Carswell, who, 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 who's uh, an evangelist in the north of England. He said, the best mission I ever did was in the New Forest, where at this church, if you joined the church, you had to join a local group as part of the criteria of joining. He said, so everyone, once a week, was basket weaving or bowls club, and, and then they all came along. Certainly for me, with Christian workers at All Souls, as we recruit them, that, that we have the following criteria. Are you reading your Bible each day? Because if you're not, you're not going to keep going. Secondly, are you having a day off? Because we don't break God's laws, they break us. We'll have a, you know, eventually. Roger said to me, I didn't take a day off, and then all the days I didn't take, I took in a row. <laughs> you see, we'll have a, we'll have a breakdown. Uh, but thirdly, are you doing something regular with non-Christians? I do chess club, 8 o'clock every uh, Thursday morning with the kids. We, I do chess club and just see w w what the Lord gives me in his sovereignty. So those, those, those are there. What is the big issue on creativity as we close now, I think, for us? What is the silver bullet? And I'm a course guy, but what's the silver bullet for us, certainly in London? I don't know about here. Can I tell you, it is, it is without question one-to-one -one work. It's the relational going at the moment to Christians and non-Christians, and then saying, can I get the Bible open with you? I want to finish today by saying, and so if you look at the back page, 
Can you see the word one-to-one? -one? I, 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 again, I don't produce the word one-to-one, -one, but I, I think it's wonderful what Richard Borgenon's done. Here is the copy of it, but there, you read through, if you can see the back page, brothers, you read through, uh, you say, why don't you read the, the passage of the Bible, and then you're not a Bible teacher, you're a sharer, and then you just, you just read through the comments on it and say, what do you make of that? But we just get the Bible open with people. So we're, relation, we're relational, it's confidential, we're, we're with friends, but then we cross the pain line and say, would you like to look at the Bible with me? Talking Jesus says, this was pre-pandemic, that one in five people who like you would like to do it. So 80% rejection, but 20% would like to do it. And just, you know, what I'm trying to train the men to do at All Souls is just get the Bible open. They all get two copies of Word One to One and, and just get it open. And just say, look, do you want to have a look? And a lot of people will say no, but some people will say, yeah. Yeah, there's probably a nuclear submarine parked off Cornwall. I think I'll have a look. <coughs> so, guys, that's what, I'd, that's what I'd say. But as you go away, can I say evangelism is always these three. It's always God's sovereignty. We've got to pray. It's always gospel integrity. We've got to tell the truth. It's always creativity. We've got to reach out. And I think the big way of reaching out now is this one-to-one. -one. And often, I think, in, in, in Ulster, people weren't raised with it. You got it by osmosis with your lovely parents and families just got taken along. There wasn't the intentional, let's get the Bible open one-to-one. -one. But the new thing that I think the generation needs, certainly back in London, is this one-to-one -one work, journeying with people. So again, this guy I, met, I read with up on the North Coast, probably 25 times, 30 times, we phoned each other each week, 20 minutes just looking at the Bible. Sometimes he'd be driving in his car but we just kept opening the Bible. And as we preach Christ, God opens blind eyes. Let's pray. So it's been a long day. What is the one or two things to take away, the one thing to take away to remember in 15 years' time? Father, in all of this, we pray for the glory of the Lord Jesus. Please, may, your, may we honour your Son. Lord, may our identity be in your grace, so whatever the rejection, we are secure. May we know you're sovereign, organising our lives and everyone we're next to. And Lord, may we know the powers in the word that as we speak Christ, you open blind eyes. Lord, give us that confidence in, 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 in identity, in grace, sovereignty, and in the power of your word. As we go, Lord, make us men who are confident of these things, we pray. Amen.